Ich bin Annegret Larsen und ich bin nicht so lange in Niederland und ich kann nicht so gut Niederlands praten. Wow. Aber okay. ich denke, <lacht> dass das besser ist für Mai, aber auch für Jahr, als ich diese Präsentation in Engels halt äh, tue. Okay? So, sorry for this. But uh, I'm going to try in the future, okay? So, um, my, I don't have the, uh, yeah. So, what I'm going to present here is work that I have been doing in the past years in the countries, uh, Switzerland and Germany, but also at the University of Manchester afterwards. <coughs> and it is, so my research focus is on understanding the feedbacks between the biotic and the abiotic environment, which means between the beaver and the physical processes. So I'm not an ecologist. I do not investigate the uh, effects on biodiversity, for example, that are very large on, from beavers, but on the physical processes in the rivers, geomorphology, hydrology, and biogeochemistry. And I'm trying to address all three of them in 15 minutes. So first of all, when we go when we walk beaver influence along a climate gradient, we are all aware that those influences vary very much depending on in which climate zone or which, uh, yeah, which um, landscape you are, which I heard already before in the discussion, right? It's not everywhere the same. So here, for example, um, we see very more north Canada, right? We're going down into semi-arid US. These are all different beaver ponds that I show. This is in Switzerland, one of our research sites. This is in semi-arid Mexico, actually. And this is now here in Patagonia, where beavers are invasive. So all these different landscapes are occupied by beavers, and they are all differently affected by beavers. So now I'm going to first show you quite a complex slide. So I hope I'm not going to lose you. I'm trying to explain it. So. Um, we go from left to right on that graph, right? So um, these are uh, along a landscape cascade, right? But if we start at A1 here, then the rivers, when you think about from the mountain, going from the mountain into the delta, so the Netherlands would be probably more down here, yeah? So the valleys become, without beavers here on the top, the valleys become less and less, um, more, they're more incised upstream, and this we call semi-confined, when um, the valleys become a little bit wider, alluvial already, and then we go further downstream, and the valleys become wider, and at the very end, they are uh, multi-thread and deltaic systems. So when we look at the influence of the beaver on those different types of um, uh, river landscapes, right, they affect it all very differently. So at the very top, for example, we get what we call beaver cascades, and we go further downstream and we get more ponds and beaver meadows, and further downstream the effect changes then, becomes uh, less um, large, and at the very end we might not get a very large change in channel uh, structure or wetland, because there are already many wetlands around and many ponds and many still water areas, so the effect might not be that large. Yeah? So different um, gradients in the landscape, we go from left to right, as I said, from valley slope is decreasing from the top left. This is very strange. This, oh, sorry. So at the very top from the left, to go to the right, we have different types of connectivity in the landscape. We have um, um, different gradients in lentic lotic ecosystem transitions, for example. So I don't want to go more into detail here. Uh, this is what uh, we call context dependency of the beaver impact. Yeah, but of course, what, so what I'm doing is mainly that I look. I'm not a beaver scientist in a sense. I am a beaver dam scientist. So I investigate the main influence of the beaver on the landscape, which is hydrologically. It is by damming the rivers, right? That is their main influence. That is their ecosystem engineering, that how they influence the landscape. So of course, it all starts with hydrology then, right? And so if you have the beaver dam here at the top, right? what the beaver da does through the beaver dam is it creates a larger water height upstream of the dam, right? And that means that water goes onto the floodplain here, it's a flow diversion, and the water goes back onto the floodplain. It is often unchannelized, the flow on the floodplain, something that we very much miss in our landscape nowadays. It's unchannelized flow, yeah? And that then 
slowly sinks into the subsurface. It's called hyperic flow there, right? It goes into the shallow groundwater table of the floodplain. It creates a wetland and it goes back into the stream downstream of the dam. So it also has effect on the channel bed, for example, here where we also get an increase of hyperic flow. Why is hyperic flow or like subsurface flow important? It is because many biogeochemical processes are happening in the subsurface. So and that's what, we're going to do, what I'm going to talk in the next slides about. We found uh, that's um, basically the confirmation of what I said before. So we find a uh, rise in um, the shallow groundwater table associated with beaver dams here from Germany. This is the river level, that's a groundwater level, so it rises around the beaver dam, and that is how conceptually the zone of groundwater table rise, shallow groundwater table rise, I'm talking about, uh, um, along a beaver dam varies. And what, um, so what is the second hydrological effect, of course, of so groundwater table rise is, right, increase in subsurface flow, like different biochemical processes happening there. It's also that we get definitely an increase in still water area. So an Atlantic area, right, in, within beaver, within areas that are occupied by beavers or areas that are damped by beavers. And this is everywhere to be, right, that's one of their main impacts. So an increase of water surface storage uh, when beavers dam a landscape. This is what that, so this is from very many different studies in the, around the world that we've collided here. And then, after all, through all these changes that the beaver does, it changes the biogeochemistry, it changes the chemistry of the water or the water quality. Yeah? So there are different types of changes that we've summarized here. You can read that in our recent paper, which is almost a book, so I would really look at it uh, <laughs> Um, maybe uh, in parts <laughs> from time to time. And so um, what happens yeah. is um, that we have, of course, enhanced atmospheric fluxes resulting in a wetland creation. Oh, sorry. We have um, an, a change in the outflowing fluxes of water, right? We have a change upstream of dams and downstream of dams. And I don't want to go more into detail here because I can show that a little bit better summarized on the next slide. So this is what we found overall in the literature, the changes in water quality due to beaver damming. Yeah? So the picture is relatively clear. We have definitely an increase in DOC downstream of beaver dams. Oh, sorry. Uh, dissolved organic carbon, that is. Yeah, thank you for that. So, so DOC is dissolved organic carbon, which means an increase in carbon in freshly microbial derived, I have a feedback, freshly microbial derived um, uh, carbon um, downstream of beaver dams, which means we have a lot of microbes in all these ponds, right, that produce, that do, they degenerate the carbon that is collected in the ponds, and then we have a, get an increase of carbon downstream. So that is um, an increase in water quality, yeah, because this carbon is then going to be the food for other animals downstream of the beaver dam. So much less coherent, but still a very clear trend is nitrate. So that was one of the things that we were after when we did this study. So we find definitely, definitely in almost all the beaver ponds around the world, basically, that we get a decrease in nitrate content in the water downstream of beaver meadows and beaver cascades. Then ammonium seems to be an increase, which is um, the opposite here, right? But I'm not going to talk that much about ammonium in the talk. And then we have phosphate. So nobody knows what phosphate does. But we definitely have an increase, a decrease in discharge downstream, probably due to groundwater infiltration and also, um, and also evaporation right, in beaver ponds. And we definitely have a decrease in suspended sediment, which is, of course, somewhat associated also with the nitrate reduction. So what then we wanted to find out that um, 
we, that there is, so it is clear that there are effects of age. So we have mostly in the, um, in the Switzerland where I worked before, we had mostly very young systems because the beaver only started da damming those um, small rivers in 2009. So it had very young beaver cascades and very young beaver meadows. However, in Germany, where the beaver is much longer already around, the, um, the, um, yeah, the areas of occupation where they dam it are much older and the beavers are already 20 years longer there. So we tried to find out the, uh, yeah, the differences, or if there are differences, if those systems mature, if they become older, and if then the influence changes, right? So, and what I want you to, what I want to, uh, to do now is walk you through the water nutrient dynamics of the studies, and I'm only going to pick a few slides, okay? And if uh, I miss explaining something, or if there are still questions open, then please ask me afterwards or during the talk, okay? So what we find pretty coherently, what all the literature found before, that we have a reduction in nitrate almost throughout the entire year, but we definitely also have um, a time during the year, so this is a time that is um, uh, nitrogen in the, or nitrate in the water, and we have a time where we have more um, nitrate downstream than we have upstream, which are these blue points here, where the beaver, the beaver occupation area, the beaver ponds become a source of nitrate, but through most of the year, we have a sink, right? So where we have a reduction in nitrate going downstream um, uh, along a beaver cascade. But it's not always the case. Huh? It depends on the season, it depends on the discharge very likely, what I'm going to show before. And when we calculate efficiency, which I can explain now in detail, but I don't think we have time for that here, is that we can overall say that we have got a 35 to 65 nitrate removal efficiency across um, median flow conditions, right? Which means we lose nitrate within those systems. So this is confirmed in all the other cascade and meadow systems of beavers. So we have a very coherent trend that this is happening. Of course, numbers vary. Here, for example, we have 10 to 30 percent uh, removal efficiencies. And um, in Martin, which is now a beaver meadow, so a different system, a wider system, there the trend is almost, uh, yeah, it is the, the most obvious. Yeah, so the beaver meadow seems to be more efficient in removing nitrate from the water than the beaver cascades. This has to do, that's the last complicated graph I'm going to show, sorry for that. So this has to do with the discharge as well. That's all I want to say here. So it doesn't, it's not only has to do with the water area and the groundwater infiltration and the increase in still water, it also has to do with the discharge that is walking through the system. So we're almost there. That was the hard science part. Um, now, the last question, or one of the last questions that we ask ourselves is what about season, seasonal biomass dynamics? Because these have very large influences on the biogeochemistry, and we did not investigate that. And this is why we're having uh, three projects in Switzerland at the moment, and that might be of interest also for you as an audience. So we're running citizen science projects in Switzerland together with the Biberfachstelle of uh, Switzerland together with Info Fauna, which is a biodiversity center, and it's funded all by the Bundesamt für Umwelt, by the BAFU, and we investigate the functiona functionality of beaver dams on a landscape scale. So what they are doing is, anyway, independent of us, a national beaver census in 2022, which means that volunteers in Switzerland walk along all Swiss streams and map the signs of beaver occupation. Yeah? From that, they calculate population number. And what we do associated to this is that we are making them, the poor volunteers, sample water upstream and downstream of beaver populated areas and analyzing them in combination with this estimation of beaver ponded area and all sorts of things that we also evaluate um, and trying to find out through this how overall in Switzerland, in all the streams occupied by Viva, the, 
the nitrogen or the nitrate levels in those water changes, not only nitrate but also phosphate and all sorts of other um, water quality indicators. So that's what we're going to do in 2022. And, and so now I've, I've talked a lot about water quality and nitrate reduction in the water. Just very quickly, carbon dynamics, we also investigated that. We see, as I said before already, a very, very clear trend in carbon increase downstream, or DOC, it's, uh, D, here it's called DOM, now very confusing. So <laughs> an increase of um, carbon, of dissolved organic carbon in the water. Yeah. And what we also found, though, on top of the water is that beaver influence the, um, the storage of carbon, the sequestration of carbon in the soils surrounding the beaver ponds, right, and within the beaver ponds. So we get sequestration carbon storage over long time periods within those systems. And um, that is probably around 30 to 50 percent more than under normal non-beaver conditions. Yeah? And, um, but what we have not found out yet is if we have emissions in beaver meadows, so beaver ponds, um, because it's a still water area, it's degrading carbon at the bottom, right? So because it's uh, um, under anorganic uh, conditions, the carbon that falls into the pond or in the still water area is degrading there, but very slowly. And that produces fluxes, atmospheric fluxes then of CO2 and methane. But we don't know how they balance together with the carbon sequestration and the increase of DOC of dissolved organic carbon downstream of the beaver. So in order to understand if the beaver actually creates a sink or a source of carbon, right, we need to further investigate this. And that's what we're doing in a second project within those citizen science projects in Switzerland, um, in which we investigate um, the carbon flux balance. So, and overall, at the end, that's something very pragmatic now after all this science, we're trying to understand if we can use the beaver in order to deliver those ecosystem services that were talked about, like carbon storage and nitrate removal, for example, if we can deliberately place the beaver or give it a place in a spot in the landscape where it delivers what we as people want it to do, right? But that's very human-centric perspective, mm -hmm. huh? Very human-centric, but we're trying it. So we're doing this for Switzerland, of course, because it is a project in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. However, I ran the model yesterday for the Netherlands. <laughs> But it shows it's actually still wrong in the Netherlands. So we need to, of course, validate it because here, it, for example, I, th I can't see it from here very well. This is the map, the output map. But we can see that it is supposed to dam the Maas, I think, and the Waal and the Rhine. And I don't think it's going to do this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is not correct, yeah, just for. Uh, so. No, it's because, uh, it's, it's because of a data set problem, but that is something that we would need to adjust, right? Because it, the model is made for Switzerland, it's just not the same conditions. So, yeah, and uh, I spare you all the summary. I think uh, you, I talked a lot about science here. Uh, uh, we have a removal of nitrate overall, an increase in carbon storage likely, but we need to further investigate it. We don't know yet so much about the seasonal dynamics, so we have to look into this. And we are definitely able to model the ecosystem services that beaver can deliver, yeah? but that also needs a more investigation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have to put your story a little bit in context. You, you talk from... Switzerland, that damming is the most important influence of the beaver. In the Netherlands, the beavers have this big damming influence in Limburg, where they are in large numbers, and now in the Drenthe, slowly they are starting to colonize the regional river systems and they are starting to dam. It's just that we see them starting with this influence of damming. And the, the, the fear that we have in the Netherlands mostly is for the low-lying areas for de laaggelegen gebieden waar we bang zijn voor overstromingen. So for us, their digging influence is also very large. And, 
But de de uh, main story, het heel belangrijk deel van haar verhaal... is dat ze door goed onderzoek te doen... aspecten laat zien die voor de maatschappij positieve gevolgen kunnen hebben. Zoals die ecosysteemdiensten. Ecosysteemdiensten van het vastleggen van CO2. Het verbeteren van de waterkwaliteit. En de review die ze geschreven heeft is echt aan te bevelen. Heel mooi stuk werk wat gepubliceerd is. De, een vergelijkbare studie is gedaan door een natuurorganisatie in Engeland... samen met de Universiteit van Exeter, de River Otter Beaver Trial. Die mensen hebben een fantastisch verhaal neergezet... waarin ze heel genuanceerd laten zien hoe de bever positieve en negatieve effecten heeft... en hoe die tegen elkaar afgewogen kunnen zijn. Heel gebalanceerd. En het is heel belangrijk dat dit soort werk gebeurt. Ja. Dat is echt fantastisch. We gaan, de vraag, we gaan de zaal vragen of ze misschien aan jullie iets willen vragen. Aan u. Is er iemand in de zaal die een vraag wil stellen aan Annegret? Fantastisch. Wil je ook even voorstellen, alsjeblieft? Jazeker. Uh, wil je van Eren, waterschap Vlei en Veluwe tegenwoordig... Uh, kan ik hem in het Nederlands stellen, Engels? Maar langzaam. Langzaam. Ah ja, langzaam kan. Um, zijn de, de effecten van het onderzoek, zeg maar, hè, van, van de invloeden van zo'n beverdam, uh, ook afgezet tegen de omvang van het systeem? Of hoeveel ruimte je in het watersysteem hebt, of daaromheen bijvoorbeeld? Want Nederland is heel krap en klein en iedere meter is bezet. So um, I hope I understood it right. So um, how how you mean how much uh, space the beaver needs along the river floodplains, right? Yeah, yeah, for the positive effects to mm. uh, be optimal or. Yeah, so the that is a difficult question, of course, because it asks a specific number. I don't think you can give a specific number, but the larger the area the more the effect is, in a sense. That's what we're trying to find out in Switzerland now, if it scales as well, you know. If you have more ponds, if that scales with, for example, nitrogen removal from the system, or if there are other things like discharge, that is more important for that. But what we're doing in this model that I presented at the, at the end is that we identify especially valley bottoms, so floodplains, basically, where we can confine the beaver to in a sense and where if we give them that entire space of the floodplain if it then can deliver what we want it to do so thank you ik heb een uh, vraag uit uh, uit de chat um, van isabo uh, what are the possible uh, causes of the decrease of nitrate The causes? Yes. Yeah, well, that are biogeochemical processes within the water column, so within the still water area, that have to do with an increase in carbon um, uh, yeah, deposition mm -hmm. and yeah, with denitrification within the still water mm -hmm. areas. Okay. Yeah. Um, We think, hopefully. Okay. Uh, Gerrit Jan van Dijk, uh, did you look after an event, uh, what's happening? Because also uh, when the, the dam is washed away, what's, what, what, what for effect is that on the area and, and, the, uh, and the night range? Yeah, there we uh, have only qualitative uh, investigations on the event-based uh, Removal, for example, of dams. Of course, once the beaver dam is removed, the effects on the biogeochemical changes are gone, yeah? Because uh, the river is going to incise back into its old bed. That's normally what's happening. And then the river is just like it was before, except of the carbon sequestration in the soil. That apparently also stays over decades or even longer, higher than in, when compared to non-beaver-occupied areas. Yeah. But that's when you look at biogeochemistry, then the, the changes are gone as soon as the beaver dam is breached and the river has mostly cut back into its old bed. Annegret, yeah. if I may ask you, in your paper itself, you describe the long-term changes post-beaver. Mm. And you say that the valley bottom and the river bottom changes. So where a river is very much incised, which is happening in the Netherlands as well, 
over time it changes. So there is a long-term effect of beavers on the valley floor, the river floor, mm. and the hydrology. Can you explain that, maybe? Yeah, that's a very good point. So what we find is that the river becomes, due to beaver occupation, even, about, I mean, so a beaver meadow, like a, a, a wider area in which the beaver settles, is normally a mosaic of ponds, and still water areas, like uh, still water areas, then also slightly faster flowing areas, and of course the stream. Yeah? And in time, what happens when you let the system mature is that the river becomes often a multi channel system. So the complexity of the channel network and of the flow conditions within this entire area changes. And when you imagine that so we have incision of streams, because we have channelized them all. So all the water goes through one point, which means there's more stream power, there's more incision. So if you create a multi-channel network, a river that flows through many, many channels, right? Then you have less stream power in one area, in one channel, which means that often the channel bed, the historically incised channel bed, which we wanted, we wanted it to incise, right? So, but now we can, if we're very lucky, reverse this because we have less stream power on each of the channel points, basically, if we have a multi-thread, a multi-channel system. And that, if we achieve that, if the beaver can achieve this in time, but we need to give a time for this, yeah, then we can potentially, and I say potentially because I'm a scientist, I'm careful, so we can potentially in places reverse the damage that we have done to the channel networks. Of course, that's not going to be feasible everywhere because we all live almost everywhere, right? Especially in the Netherlands and in Switzerland and Germany. But we might be able to identify areas where we can risk this experiment with the beaver. And it looks like that the science shows that it is possible. Yeah. Ja, um, Daan maakte net uh, reclame voor een prachtige review en dat heeft uh, kijkers thuis tot de vraag gebracht Where can we find your review? Shall we put a link in the, in the chat? Yes, of course. Yeah, it's open source. It's so open source, can. that's nice. That's everybody nice. can access. Uh, <laughs> perhaps a question from my uh, uh, point of view, because Daan already explained that protection of our dikes is very um, top of mind, I might say. And you, you're, you're uh, stating that perhaps the beaver can be a co-worker in improving water quality. How would you balance these two things in the Netherlands? Oh. <laughs> so I believe this is why I am here. <laughs> because I want to ask this question to the audience. Awesome. Yeah, in a sense. Because um, I am relatively new to the Netherlands and every country that I've worked with a beaver in had different problems and different yeah, um, approaches towards it. And there's no way of doing this type of approaches without talking to the people and understanding what the context is and where the main problems with the beaver lies. So, and I think uh, this is a question very interesting the, yeah. and it's a question for this symposium, maybe okay, that's less nice. than for me. Oké, okay. nou het is duidelijk, Annegret legt bij in jullie midden neer, als jullie haar verhaal horen, uh, de, de bever als, als medewerker waterkwaliteit. Um, hoe gaan we daarover uh, met elkaar in gesprek? Wie van jullie wil daar even op reageren? Anders krijg je de beurt hoor, dat is de relatief simpel in dit leven. Nou, dan ga ik een beurt uitdelen. Mark, jij bent een grote dijkbewaker. Um, kom even bij. Um, als je dit verhaal zo hoort, hè, je, hebt, je hebt dat gebied waar, uh, ja, waar het laag gelegen is, maar waar volgens mij ook wel heel veel natuur is en heel veel van dat ondiepe water. Hoe kijk je tegen dit verhaal aan? Ja, ik, ik, uh, ik denk dat de mogelijkheden die zijn er. Uh, en zeker in Beekdalen, waar je dus inderdaad de ruimte hebt, waar je de ruimte hebt dat het water weg kan. Aan de andere kant hebben we ook wel eens een beverdam gehad in een wat meer landbouwachtige uh, situatie. En dan zie je het effect van een meter hoog beverdam is een kilometer verder in het ground level 
En het grondwater uh, zie je daar de effecten aan van. Dus het effect is veel groter. Ook op het land. Op het land. En dan kom je toch wel met verschillende belangen. Wat wil je ook zegt. Uh, iedere vierkante meter heeft ongeveer drie functies. En nou, dan ga je toch wel een beetje... Dan zie ik wel wat problemen. Maar het is hydro, uh, voor de planologen is het een mooie uitdaging. Oh. En maar het waterschap van Mark heeft op, op grote schaal in Drenthe en in Noord-Nederland ingegrepen en door beken te herstellen. En door grote delen van de beken ruimte te scheppen. We doen dat natuurlijk Rijkswaterstaat, doet dat met ruimte voor de rivieren. Er wordt in Nederland op heel veel plaatsen ruimte geschapen. En op die plek scheppen wij de randvoorwaarden waar een bever vervolgens in detail invulling kan doen. Dus die bever draagt heel erg bij in die herstelde natuurgebieden waar de ruimte is gegeven. Zo moeten we het doen. En dit is ook de ervaring in Duitsland. Die jongens van de NABU hebben nu twintig jaar veel meer ervaring met bevers. En die zeggen, de grootste effecten vinden binnen twintig meter plaats van de River Channel. Daar moeten we de ruimte creëren, in ieder geval. Dan ben je in ieder geval 90% van je, van je spanningsveld kwijt. En als je erin slaagt om een bredere rivier, een bredere ruimte te bieden, dan kunnen die positieve effecten nog veel groter worden. Maar dit raakt rechtstreeks aan jouw vraag, Wiljo. Van uh, hoeveel ruimte hebben we ervoor nodig? Uh, in ieder geval 20 meter langs de beek en bij voorkeur bredere situaties. Dit is een mooi moment om pauze te gaan houden.